Hello, I'm Laili Mapayan, Executive Director of the Wellesley Centers for Women and Professor of Africana Studies at Wellesley College. Welcome to our panel on understanding the role of structural racism in economic inequality. Structural racism refers to the form of racial bias that is baked into society based on the long-term effect of laws, policies, and norms that create advantages for white people and disadvantages for black and brown people. Because these laws, policies, and norms operate in the background, often divorced from people's personal feelings about race and racial diversity, they require special attention. One of the most pernicious effects of structural racism is its tendency to exacerbate wealth inequalities between people of different races. We've all seen the data. The average net worth for a white American household is 10 times that of a black American family. We can't answer the question of how this happened without looking straight into the eye of structural racism. And if we wanna change this reality, we have to dismantle structural racism. We also know that we need to look at structural racism intersectionally meaning that we take race, gender, socioeconomic status, and other variables into consideration simultaneously. One of the earliest findings about the pandemic economy was that people of color, particularly women, were uniquely affected because of their predominance in the service industries, healthcare, childcare, food service, retail and delivery work, utilities, the cleaning and sanitation professions, for example, even agriculture. These were originally the invisible positions, low paid, low status, low flexibility jobs held by black and brown people, immigrants, and others who were economically marginal. And yet the pandemic made us realize that along with doctors and nurses, these people were essential workers, people without whom society as we know it can't function. So this finding put us in a conundrum. Here's this group of workers that we must value and yet we have not valued them. We rely on them and yet we don't reward them. This is the effect of structural racism on economic inequality in bold relief. The pandemic amplified existing inequalities and yet it presented us with an opportunity to take more concerted action to eradicate structural racism and its effect on the economic prosperity and security of people of all racial and ethnic groups in the nation. How do we move forward? We have three great panelists today who are prepared to address these themes, particularly as they relate to women. And I'm gonna give a quick introduction of each. Their full bios are on the Summit website and I encourage everyone to take a look. Gloria Perez is president and CEO of the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, the first statewide women's foundation in the country. The Women's Foundation of Minnesota has distributed more than $31 million through community investments. It conducts ongoing research on the status of women and girls in Minnesota and advocates for public policy that results in greater economic security and safety for women and their families and invests in organizations and leaders to build the field of service and achieve gender and racial e equity. Paulina Lopez Gonzalez is the economist in residence at NDWA Labs, the social innovation partner of the National Domestic Workers Alliance the nation's leading organization working for the power, respect, and dignity of more than 2 million nannies, house cleaners, and home care workers in the United States. Paulina leads NWD NDWA Labs research work to bring more domestic workers into our month-to-month -month and year-to-year -year understanding of the economy. Prior to joining NDWA Labs, Paulina served as a policy and social innovations fellow at NDWA. Before joining the domestic worker movement, she worked as an economist in Mexico's central bank. Rebecca Dixon is executive director of the National Employment Law Project, a leading advocacy organization working to build a just and inclusive economy where all workers have expansive rights and thrive in good jobs. Rebecca is a respected national leader in federal workers' rights advocacy and in great demand for her thought leadership at the intersection of labor and racial equality. So now let's begin our conversation. Gloria, Paulina, and Rebecca, thank you for being here. It's a privilege to be sharing the virtual stage with you. And I know this is a topic that we all care about, the relationship between structural racism and economic inequality for women, especially women of color. Not only do we all care about it, but we're all actively working from our respective positions to address these conditions in meaningful and measurable ways. To get our conversation started, I think it would be helpful if our audience could hear you talking about the view from your respective organizations and positions. Let's start with you, Gloria. 
As president and CEO of the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, you have the enviable position of being able to give out money, that is to direct funds in ways that solve problems for the women of Minnesota. Tell us about what you're seeing and what the women of Minnesota can help us understand about the plight of women and in particular women of color as they navigate both structural racism and economic vulnerability. Thank you for this question. The Women's Foundation of Minnesota has been partnering with the University of Minnesota to produce a status of women and girls report every two years. And we've been doing this in partnership since 2009. And um, we are looking at the areas of economics, safety, health, and leadership in our research. And what I would say stands out for us right now is that things haven't gotten much better. And in fact, in fact, in many regards, um, women are not faring um, as well as they were two years ago, obviously because of the pandemic. I think the uprising for racial justice has certainly been part of that. But in, in two areas I would point out are that we are centering the finishing line for Latinas, Black, Somali women in Minnesota as our North Star and finish line in the fight for pay equity. That continues to be a, a big disparity. We heard earlier about you know, celebrating Equal Pay Day uh, in March. Um, and for Latinas, we're not celebrating Equal Pay Day until December 8th because Latinas are making 55 cents on the dollar compared to white men and uh, it's 61 cents on the dollar for black women. And so we are, are centering the people who are most impacted by these inequities in our work. Secondly, I would say that violence and mental health have come out as themes that women are experiencing um, across the state. And so it's violence in homes, it's um, bias, it's violence um, against our Asian Pacific Islanders in Minnesota. And then when we're thinking about the centering of women in families, um, caring for children and caring for elders, we find that the mental health and fragility of families is at stake. And so I feel like this is not just a Minnesota issue, but something that can resonate nationally. That makes complete sense. Thank you for sharing that. Pauline, I'd love to turn to you now. As economists and residents at NDWA Labs, your organization has its finger on the pulse of a large constituency of largely women of color in economically precarious positions, namely domestic workers. Yet you live and work in the innovation arm of NDWA. How does being focused on innovation help you see the situation of women of color and economically disadvantaged women generally, and to perhaps see solutions that others don't yet see? Thank you for that question. At NEWA Labs, we know that there's no single solution to transforming the domestic work industry. As an innovation lab, we build products where they are needed, form partnerships when we can, and work to shift culture where it's creating a barrier. So I'll share a concrete example. Early in the pandemic, at a time when everyone was being cautioned against being in touch with people outside their own households, we knew that domestic workers, who by definition work from other people's homes, would face devastating challenges and uncertainties about their work and livelihoods. We needed to know more about the challenges domestic workers were facing in an ever-changing environment. This means we needed more data and we needed it more frequently, and we needed to know it in real time and at scale. So this is how we decided to explore large-scale surveys as a lever that was not traditionally in our wheelhouse. We rapidly iterated and built upon an automated chatbot we built on Facebook in 2019. So by 2020, NDWA Labs developed our La Alianza News chatbot into a groundbreaking research tool that surveys thousands of Spanish-speaking domestic workers every week, producing first-of-its-kind data for a workforce that is essential but overlooked in mainstream economic analysis. As a part of this ongoing research, we produce regular reports on Spanish-speaking domestic workers' economic situation and working conditions, and we release monthly reports on the economic situation of domestic workers on the same day of the Bureau of Labor Statistics jobs report release, which happens to be today. So we'll have a report coming out later. Um, we aim to fill the existing gap in high quality frequent data collection and analysis about the domestic work sector. La Alianza workers live in all 50 US states, DC and Puerto Rico. And to our knowledge, it is the largest digital aggregation of Spanish speaking domestic workers in the country. We have now been serving domestic workers weekly for more than two years. We continue to learn from them every day, and we think we have only scratched the surface. 
The surveys confirmed at scale what we knew domestic workers were going through, massive job loss, lack of access to government assistance, food insecurity, and housing instability. We hope making visible the state of domestic workers will give us all a fuller understanding of how the most vulnerable among us are doing. Thank you. These are some brilliant innovations, and I really like how you've leveraged both big data and social media to do this work. Rebecca, your turn now. As executive director of the National Employment Law Project, you have your finger on the pulse of workers' rights, employment equity issues, and of course, the legal frameworks related to all of the above. You've written cogently on things the government can do to strengthen these frameworks because you have an eagle eye for the gaps. What does our audience need to know about what the problem of structural racism feeding economic inequality looks like from your vantage point? Thank you so much for that question. Um, opportunity is constrained in this country, and I would go further to say opportunity is segregated in this country. 40% of jobs in our economy pay poverty level wages. And as we've seen on display in this pandemic, the burden of that is uneven, falling most heavily on women and workers of color. In fact, women make up 64% of the 40 lowest paying jobs. Discrimination accounts for 38% of the gender wage gap. For Black women who are at the intersection of their identities, this creates a double bind. The Blacker an occupation is or becomes, the lower the wages. The more female dominated an occupation is, the more undervalued that work is, especially care work. Consequently, Black women's share of the low paid workforce is five times their share of the overall workforce. And there's a name for what I'm describing. It's called occupational segregation. Occupational segregation means that persistently across time, women and people of color have been shunted into low paying, precarious and often unsafe work. And occupational segregation's glass and concrete ceilings means that they stay there for decades, sometimes a lifetime. As a country, we've made policy choices that have embedded the structural racism in our laws, policies and practices. For example, when we passed the New Deal, our foundational labor rights, benefits, protections, things like social security, unemployment insurance, um, the right to organize. We excluded large segments of workers, including an estimated 90% of black women. That exclusion has meant that race and gender, wealth gaps and wage gaps have been expanding rather than closing, expanding even as women get more education and training. This means that we need better solutions that center the needs and experiences of women and people of color to ensure that we are purposely including them in our legal and policy remedies that would allow all workers to have expansive rights and thrive in good jobs. Thank you, that's a very illuminating analysis. So thanks to all of you. My second question gets a little more personal. As a woman of color, there are times when we dig into our cultures, our background, and even at times our own personal journeys to find solutions and think about problems in new ways. Culture in and of itself can be a kind of well of innovation when it comes to social problem solving. What are some perspectives you've drawn and solutions you've created based on your own cultural knowledge of what women of color and their families experience vis-a-vis -vis racism and our economic lives? Rebecca, you've actually spoken openly about growing up in rural Mississippi as the descendant of slaves and sharecroppers and how this has influenced your point of view. So let's start with you. For me, this has really influenced my perspective on what's needed in the economy and what's possible for women to thrive. So I grew up poor in rural Southwest Mississippi, um, one of the lushest, greenest places in the summertime. It's also the kind of place that had segregated schools until 1969 and where there were Ku Klux Klan flyers being tacked to our church door in 1989. My grandmother, uh, Allie Mack, and my great grandmother, Lucille, they were sharecroppers and domestics, and they were two of the 90% of Black women who were excluded from the New Deal. And though they worked hard their whole lives, they died with nothing but wisdom and resilience to pass on to me. For me, policy has had real impacts, and those policies have followed for generations. And I understand deeply what is at stake in this work, uh, this work that I do to ensure that race and gender don't determine your fate in the labor market. And I'm still connected to this community where I grew up, so I have a contemporary window into who's being hurt the most by our policy choices. As an attorney, I'm the person who hears from friends, cousins, nieces back home all the time. And often what we're doing is workshopping injustices that have cropped up from them for them because of occupational segregation. And because occupational segregation is not one dimensional, 
it's like a Venn diagram of exploitation and struggle that these women are facing all the time. So for example, my best friend from high school, we've spent time trying to figure out how to appeal an unemployment insurance claim. She's been uh, fired for taking family medical leave. She's had to, we've had to chase down her employer to get her last paycheck. All of these things are happening um, all the time for women of color. And we have to look at our solutions and we can't approach them as if woman, black woman's economic security and mobility is all about an individual effort or personal responsibility. We have to actually hold that policy, uh, the, the way that policy plays in this and that the federal government has a responsibility to set floors for labor standards and for job quality. Mm -hmm. It's so important to hear the personal stories behind these kinds of policy changes that we're advocating for. Gloria, you've mentioned that you're originally from San Antonio, Texas, a place that's about 180 degrees from where you are now in Minnesota. So how has your background informed how you see solutions? Well, um, indeed, I did go uh, 1,200 miles north uh, to go to college, and part of my decision making and doing that was actually um, sort of a reckoning with my uh, with my community about the fact that growing up, education was talked about as a key to economic opportunity. And yet when I looked at my community, so many of my sisters and cousins and so forth and community were um, teen moms. And um, there was, you know, tremendous amount of uh, economic fragility in our community. But my mother was really insistent uh, that I have an opportunity for an education. So I went to a high school that had a pathway into colleges around the country. And that pathway, I would say, planted in me a belief that uh, education for me was possible beyond high school, that uh, I could have a career that was different from so many of the folks in our community. And so I think number one, that belief gap um, is something that I have continuously tried to work you know, on. Um, I've been working in two generation strategies to end poverty, working with women who have a belief now, but at the same time need to be reminded on a continuous basis that the work that they're, um, the goals that they're working for are achievable. Um, secondly, I would say that um, growing up, it was very family oriented. We were not individualistic. We were uh, communistic. And um, in that sense, leaving so that I could focus on my own education and surround myself in a more stable environment, if you will, was a difficult decision to make. And I think one that now young Latinas are, are maybe not willing to make, and they shouldn't be penalized for that. I think that we need to think about our systems being more holistic and taking into consideration the fact that women of color live in communities. And as was just um, you know expressed, we are um, constantly helping each other troubleshoot the systemic challenges that we all face. And so um, that's been an important thing for me. And then lastly, I would say, um, to introduce early on to young women of color uh, career options that have high paying uh, opportunities and growth and leadership opportunities is really so important. So having role models um, is critical. Thank you. Those points really highlight the importance of having multiple pathways to success and digging into culture for you know what those roadmaps actually look like. So Paulina, your personal journey has origins in Mexico. How does this background shape an international perspective on solutions to structural racism and economic inequality? So I would say one thing that growing up in Mexico and later moving to the U.S. has made clear is that domestic workers face very similar challenges worldwide. There's low pay, lack of benefits, rampant abuse, and the systemic op oppression they face, while it's contextually different, also comes from racist and sexist structures. So in my work at NDWA Labs, I frequently communicate with Spanish-speaking domestic workers, many of whom immigrated to the U.S. from my own home country. Um, and many of them are, were domestic workers before as well. Mm -hmm. They come to the U.S. and face additional barriers as immigrants and non-native non English speakers. One way this manifested during the pandemic, for example, was in the lack of government assistance and relief for most of these workers. 
So we need to address structural racism and inequality within individual countries, but we also need to look at the global systems of oppression that replicate these dynamics at a larger scale. Thank you. You know, I've we've heard a lot of things lately about the post-pandemic future of work. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this concept for women of color, whether women of color at the margins economically or women of color who are more economically secure but may still face other hardships. What issues have you heard women of color talking about with regard to the future of work? I know, for example, in my own case, I've heard people talking about overwork and burnout, but I've also heard women of color talking about how remote work reduces their exposure to office microaggressions and other forms of racism in the workplace. Of course, not all women of color have the freedom to work remotely, so this in and of itself is an issue. But what kinds of things are you hearing? I think, Rebecca, let's begin with you. Um, <clears throat> earlier in the pandemic, I was hearing about uh, folks working at schools and being uncomfortable going back into the classroom and feeling really like they had their back against the wall because they needed their job. Um, I've also uh, heard about the challenges with childcare and the, the way that the pandemic really messed up the system of childcare that wasn't really great to begin with. And so even when it is affordable, it's sometimes not available or, or it's um, you know closing with some frequency because of exposure to COVID. So just really struggling with, with childcare and trying to balance that. And then also the fact that a lot of the jobs that they're in don't have paid time off and just really being terrified that they're gonna have to be, they're gonna lose their job because they have to stay home with a sick child or stay home with a quarantine child. So just really trying to juggle all of that and trying to juggle all of that in addition to sort of already being stretched super thin. Yeah, I appreciate that point, especially because we know um, that many women are also, uh, you know, struggling as single parents and childcare is, you know, is that much more essential when you're a single parent as well. Um, so, you know, I appreciate you elevating that issue. Gloria, what kinds of things have you been hearing about the future of work from your constituencies? Well, what I've been hearing and reading is uh, flexibility continues to be critically important. And like you say, that is not a privilege that many uh, low wage workers have. And so thinking about that, I think will be really important. And um, being able to bring your full self and be respected in the workplace. Um, and I think part of that respect un includes having the employers understand that we live in community and have multiple pressures, um, whether it's with young children or older adults that we are caring for. And so just being able to bring that uh, reality into the workplace and still be respected for the expertise that women have and bring to the work is really important. Thank you. Paulina, what about you? What are you observing? Well, I would resonate a lot with what's been already mentioned, child care, and I would also add family care, caring for elderly adults, adults with disabilities or illnesses, and this is a universal issue. I will say as well that the future of work conversation is often fairly limited to white collar jobs and offices, mm -hmm. largely captivated with the tech industry. But the pandemic really showed the division of how we think about work. You know, mm -hmm. there was this conversation on one hand, focus on what will we do if we can't go to the office? How will workers cope at home with children, with their school needs? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there was a whole other workforce, which we also call essential workers who can't work from home. And there was a focus of a separate conversation due to the conditions that came to light and low wages, risk of getting sick and all of these other factors that we know. We actually often refer to domestic workers as the original gig workers because they have long known the precariousness of low wages, job insecurity, due to no benefits, wage theft, uncertainty about scheduling, and other conditions that workers in many more industries are facing today. So I think we should build a new system where living wages are guaranteed and benefits are available to all people instead of two particular types of jobs. When we address the root causes of inequality and not only the symptoms, then we can not only lift up workers in the margins, but we will lift everyone up. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. And another issue that I would just throw into the mix is the issue of having family-friendly work schedules. I think this sort of tacks onto what you were saying, Gloria, about flexibility um, and being able to predict your schedule, get your kids to school on time without having to, you know, 
cancel out on a shift and so on, those kinds of things. You know, it's time to make a human centric work culture for essential workers. It really is. All right. So we're sort of sliding into our uh, last bit of time. And so I want to uh, end on a very practical question. And that question um, is really aimed at the policymakers in our audience. Based on your areas of work, each of you in as a position to make policy suggestions that could advance equity and well being for women of color and their families. And of course, we know that this is not a zero sum game because better, bettering the policy climate for women of color will also lift other boats and ultimately make life better for everybody. So candidly, what is your policy wish list? I hope that our policymakers are getting out their notepads. Maybe if you could each give like three of your top policies on your policy wish list. Paulina, I'd love to start with you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll mention two key things on my list. Okay. One is that we need a National Domestic Workers Bill of Rights to extend basic rights and protections to domestic workers. This has been mentioned before, but when most of the country's workplace laws were being designed, domestic workers were specifically excluded because of racism and sexism. And this is part of the exclusions that Rebecca was talking about earlier. So we need to right these historic wrongs by making care jobs good jobs. Mm -hmm. That's why the National Domestic Workers Alliance is working to win the National Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, which was introduced last summer to establish rights for millions of home care workers, nannies, and house cleaners in the U.S. Ten states and two major cities have already passed Domestic Workers Bill of Rights or protections due to the relentless leadership of domestic worker organizing, and yet the federal recognition and comprehensive protection for this workforce is long overdue. The second piece on my list, which is also related, is that we need to invest in care infrastructure. Care jobs are the jobs that power the rest of our economy. We need a care infrastructure just like the basic infrastructure we have around roads, bridges, and broadband, but we need one that is focused on families, consumers, and workers. President Joe Biden set a precedent with his proposal to commit billions of dollars to care work, setting a strong message that care work is essential. So these investments in home and community-based services will create millions of new care jobs and allow working families to access affordable care services for their loved ones. It's a great wish list. Rebecca, what's your wish list? I will also stick to two. Um, the first one, pass a higher federal minimum wage and abolish the sub-minimum tipped wage for youth workers, uh, restaurant workers, and workers with disabilities. A majority of Black workers live in the South, so Black women, this is the only way they're going to get a raise in the South is if the federal minimum wage is raised, because a lot of those states don't have a state minimum wage. <clears throat> and then the second thing I would say is we saw how crucial and critical unemployment insurance benefits were in this pandemic. Uh, and we know that single moms and single parents tend to lose their jobs more frequently and have longer times out of the workforce trying to find a new job. So it's crucial to fix this program for good. During the pandemic, Congress went in and added $600 a week and added whole categories of workers. So like low wage workers, independent contractors, and they added additional weeks of benefits. But then by Labor Day, that had expired for everyone. Mm -hmm. And in many states, um, there are huge gaps in this program. And so I would encourage policymakers on a state level and also on the federal level to fix this program for good and to provide uh, the critical standards uh, around access and, um, and of course, around adequacy, benefit adequacy. Mm, those suggestions would go a long way. Gloria, what's your policy wish list? Well, I love what has been said already. Um, I would say in Minnesota, we're working on paid family medical leave and the ability to have that at a federal level would certainly um, be very beneficial. Um, in addition to what's been said, I would say that the child tax credit has been incredibly beneficial and we've been able to see like just through July to December that 33% of families were lifted out of poverty. And so that's a great example of just the um, impact that, you know, $500 a month more can make for a low-income family. But I'll, I'll end with that livable wage for all is really important. Thank you. That's great. And again, I couldn't agree more. Now, I did leave a little bit of time for audience questions, and only one question has come in so far. And I'd like to ask each of you to give a brief answer to this question. This questioner would like to know, how you've been effective at influencing policy with your work. I know that each of your organizations talks to policymakers, so if you could just give one nugget about your method and success there, that would be great. Paulina, let's start with you. 
Thank you. This is a great question. Um, I have the honor of working in a social movement. So we have a lot of different levers. As I mentioned before, I sit within the innovation arm of the domestic worker movement, but there's also a very effective and amazing um, field team. There's organizing happening that powers everything that we do. There's a policy team that also advocates for and works on all these policies that I was mentioning that are also part of my wish list. So I think it's a really um, effective way to just mix different methods and tactics to all um, look at the same North Star. Um, and I feel very lucky to be a part of that. Great. Thank you. Gloria, what methods have you found to be effective in your work? Well, we always lead with research and data and listening to community is one of the elements of that. And so to have a broad coalition that we are working with has been really important as well as centering the voices and lived experience of people across the community. And so when you hear a woman's experience, it really sheds light that legislators often don't get to hear. Thank you. Rebecca, you get the last word. So um, I will circle back to unemployment insurance. So NELP has been working on unemployment insurance as an expert and leader for decades. So on the federal level and also providing a lot of support to state groups that work on unemployment insurance in their, um, in their states. And we were instrumental to winning these expansions for unemployment insurance in this pandemic. Um, a total of almost 700 billion extra dollars going into families' pockets at this crucial, critical time when the economy was shut down. So um, I think that the long, uh, the long expertise, the like working at it and working at it and working at it um, has definitely meant that we've become more effective um, over time and been able to seek remedies that um, are actually much more targeted at women and workers of color. Well, thank you. This has been a great conversation, but we're at time. So I wanna take this opportunity to thank each one of you again, not just for your remarks today, but for the important work you're doing to dismantle racism and increase the prosperity of women of color and their families, and indeed people across the board. And I know our audience also thanks you. So with great appreciation, thank you.